Hello and welcome to Retro48K for a new series called Technically Correct. Now don't be scared off by the title, this series is aimed at giving you an idea of how those old retro consoles and games actually worked, how they produced those visuals and sound that were so unique that you know when you just heard a Mega Drive you knew it was a Mega Drive before you even saw any graphics. When machines had soul and this is kind of explaining how they all worked because they were all so different from each other. Um, and I've called it technically correct simply because I will be going into a bit of technical detail because you kind of have to to explain it but don't worry you don't have to have a degree in computer science or anywhere or anything like that I will try and keep it as high level as possible without going too deep um, but obviously there are some places where you have to um, and because it's a new series I thought where better to start than where a lot of people started in the 16-bit era and that's with the Sega Mega Drive or Genesis if you were American now the Mega Drive was originally released in 1988 in Japan and it was actually based on Sega's System 16 arcade hardware which was the arcade hardware responsible for the likes of Golden Axe and Alter Beast. But don't let that fool you because Sega's arcade hardware would often be revised and altered and tweaked to meet certain games so that even if it was a System 16 board it might have some custom chips on there or some tweaks so that it could do more sprites or more colours than the Mega Drive was capable of. But in general the same basic architecture was there for them, they would just maybe have a richer colour palette. And it actually meant in some cases the Mega Drive conversions of things like Alter Beast had improvements in some aspects. But without further ado let's have a look at the board. First up is the CPU, the heart of any system, and this was a Motorola 68000 clocked in there in at 7.6 MHz, which was really impressive for the time, especially at low cost. It was four times as powerful as the NES in pure MHz value, and twice that of the Super Nintendo, which wouldn't come out for a couple of years. Again, pure MHz, there is more to a CPU than that. Next up on one of the core components is the Z80 CPU. This was a Zilog CPU, which in conjunction with the Yamaha processor on the left, there you can see give that mega drive that unique sound and then we have the VDP or the video display processor and this is really the true heart of the mega drive and what allowed it to compete or just outstrip sort of PCs at the time if you were a PC gamer back in the 80s there's no way it could chuck sprites round and tiles round as fast as the mega drive it just wasn't designed for it. everything was on the CPU this had that VDP which was allowed it to just process sprites at blinding speeds up and down the screen do horizontal vertical scrolling to you know just do everything colors information was stored in there you, you name it it was stored in there the cpu would basically just send it instructions to tell it to move things and the cpu would focus on game logic hitboxes things like that the vdp would be what give it its visuals and it would basically have tiled layers that scrolled independently from each other as well as a sprite layer and a display layer but i'll get more onto exactly how that image was constructed in a bit i think firstly we should focus on exactly what were the components of the vdp and what made it up because it is a really interesting piece of kit that give you the mega drive those unique visuals that you see on screen now so that video display processor then you can think of it as a system in its own right with three sort of core elements. There was colour RAM or CRAM which contained your palette information. Then there was VRAM which was your bits of sprites and tiles and things that would be then made into what you saw on screen. And you had VSRAM which was responsible for scrolling, tracking and things like that. All of which put together and you get the Mega Drive's gorgeous visuals. And colour is quite interested on the Mega Drive so by default it had space in CRAM for 64 9 bit words. What that meant was it had 64 slots for 9 bits, and each color was made up of 9 bits 3 bits representing red, 3 bits representing green, and 3 bits representing the blue value. Which actually meant that there were a total of, if you do the maths on that, there's a total of 512 combinations. So the Mega Drive could display up to 64 of those 512 colours. Now, there were some limitations around some colours were taken up for transparency and things like that. But in general, you can think of it as it could display 64 colours on screen. And again, you might think, well, why was the colour information not stored on the sprite or on the tile? Wouldn't that make more information? in sense and then you wouldn't have to repeat well actually it was a compression saving side because you could have like in fighting games you could have ken um 
in different outfits just by swapping the palette colours and things like that and you wouldn't have to repeat complex sprite information on tiles. And there are other limits, like you had it was set up in four sets of 16 colours and you had line scroll and limitation and, and things like that. But the key thing here is, while I've said the Mega Drive could display 64 colours on screen at any one point in time, and that is accurate, it's also not accurate because there was tricks you could do that a lot of developers did on the Mega Drive using things like, one of them is called H blanks or horizontal blanks. So if you think of the Mega Drive, uh, sorry, vertical blanks. So if you think of the Mega Drive drawing its graphics down screen, scroll line at a time, you could interrupt that and swap out the color palette mid screen. So uh, often this was done on water levels. If you take Labyrinth Zone from Sonic as an example, when it gets to that tide level, it actually swaps the color palette. I'll display on screen here, you can see the color palette constantly flickering because as it's drawing each individual frame of animation, when it gets to that tide line, it's swapping out colors so that the sprites don't change or anything, but the color palette does. And a lot of developers could use this to squeeze more than 64 colors on screen at any one point in time. It was actually, you could only have 64 colors in memory at any one point in time, which is a bit different. Um, and again, this could be used quite often and it was used on water levels quite a lot, but you did have to be careful because if you were constantly swapping out color palettes, uh, you know, if you were doing it a lot on screen, like four or five times, you're gonna cause frame rate issues as you m move various bits into memory and things like that. So. It wasn't perfect, but you could squeeze out a few more colors if you wanted to. So that's colors. What about the actual rest of the graphics? Well, you can think of Mega Drive's graphics as being basically a series of tile planes or background planes or layers, whatever you call, want to call them, a sprite, a window and a display. And this was all done uh, in various modes as displayed on screen now. So much like the famed Super Nintendo Mode 7, the Mega Drive had two modes itself, it had Mode 4 and Mode 5. Mode 4 was typically used when you were doing Master System games using that add-on cartridge to actually mimic the Master System mode, and Mode 5 was typical Mega Drive graphics with a scroll layer A, scroll layer B, window and a sprite layer that was all put through a priority controller to give you your display on a background colour. So what does that all mean? Well, the best way is to use some examples. So this is Sonic 1. So it's made up of two scroll layers of tiled information, which are the background and then basically the foreground or the, the palm trees and the level that Sonic actually runs on. You've then got the sprite layer, which has got Sonic and his rings and various parts of the hood in some cases. And they are all layered on top of each other to make up what you see on screen. And they could all be scrolled and rotated independently from each other. So for example, you could have, you know, the background can scroll at a slower speed than the layer a, so therefore you get that nice parallax scrolling. But you could also scroll lines individually on each layer at different paces as well, which give the impression of even more layers. And I'm going to give you a, a more famous example now. If we take a look at just this section from Thunder Force 4, you'll see what I mean. So here as we're skimming across the water, you can quite clearly see the various sections of the water and the mountains in the background and the mountains in the foreground are all scrolling at different speeds. So it was able to pick out sections of the screen, lines in the screen, and scroll them at different speeds to give an impression of even more layers and parallax scrolling. But the other neat trick that Thunder Force does, and I think is a key one for understanding the Mega Drive where people get confused, is you can actually give the impression of more than just those two tiling layers. So what Thunder Force does is again, it uses that vertical interrupt trick and that priority controller that I'm was on the diagram before and it swaps the priority of what's displayed on top of what halfway down the screen so that you can give the if you design your tiles right you can give the impression if I put on screen here it looks like there's at least four layers to this screen and there's actually not there's only two but by swapping the priority as it gets down you give that impression of depth and this concept of multiple layers that scroll differently and then a sprite layer is key to every single Mega Drive game pretty much. You know, you would when you combine those three things together, you get what you saw on screen. 
and that's every game type from RPGs to platformers to beat em ups everything was done with those three separate scrolling layers scroll layer A, scroll layer B and then your sprite layer um, but they didn't have to always be in that order like I said with Thunder Force you could sometimes have the layer scrolling in the foreground and your sprite layer in the middle um, and you would use the window to attach the hood to it or in Streets of Rage the original because they didn't really need a lot of sort of parallax scrolling they would maybe just have one layer for the background on the boat and then the other layer for the harbour in the distance to get that depth effect it was really down to the game itself um, but it was just you know pretty much every game I could go through innumerable setups on the Mega Drive and they're all the same. Is is Afterburner just you know with tons of sprites chucking around and those layers. One layer is already providing the hood for example. But there were some limits. So the maximum width of the Mega Drive's display area was 320 pixels. But that doesn't mean that the planes had to be that width. So you can see in some screenshots here from Mickey Mania the planes actually wider than the screen size and this is to give you nice smooth scrolling so they've got a chance to queue up the next set of tiles for that plane or they might just even wrap it back around like they do with the background layer there and the other important thing about Mega Drives and its limits is within sprites itself so the, there were some limits to the number of sprites in the Mega Drive so pretty much 80 on screen and you were limited to around about 20 per scan line obviously this would change the Mega Drive had was quite flexible with its sizes of sprites it supported 8, 16 th and 32 and 24 width of sprite sizes but if you tried to put more on a single scan line than it could cope with you, you could see things like if you use the debug code on Sonic you can see this in action you, if you put too many on one sprite line it just stops drawing them and it just clips things out you'll see uh, Sonic here with the TV monitors when he passes into the TV monitors and it increases the sprite count too much the sprites just don't get drawn and the same with the rings that I was drawing earlier in, the, in there, they just it just stops drawing them. They're there, you can collect them, it just can't draw that many on screen at that point in time. And of course you did have some colour limitations on sprites as well in terms of, you know, them four sets of, of colours that I talked about earlier in the video in terms of the way the colour palette was divided up. But that kind of brings me to the end of how the graphics looked. Now I don't tend to go into sound too much on these ones and to be honest with the Mega Drive I don't really want to go into it because that's Yamaha process, uh, Yamaha sound chip and the z80 processor are so iconic i don't feel i would do them justice by talking about it but let's just say the mega drive was um fm synthesis so it generated sound on the fly it wasn't playing samples or anything like that so it took real skill to get a lot of this and some people did it got, it's got that awesome rock sound to it so um potentially in the future i may do a video distinctly on the Mega Drive sound. But hopefully this has given you a good overview of how the Mega Drive worked and how it put those unique graphics and visuals together. And hopefully it'll encourage you to check out some of my other videos on this. There's tons on the channel in terms of the Super Nintendo and some of the 32-bit consoles and even things like the Dreamcast. I hope you've enjoyed this. So all that's left to say really is my usual disclaimer that this is all research based in my spare time. If I've got anything wrong I do apologise. And please let me know in the comments. I do like to discuss things with the community because it's great to hear from people even if it's people who've coded these things back in the day it's always awesome so please let me know in the comments if i've got anything wrong and i hope you've enjoyed it as always i'm retro 48k and i'll see you next time